Terrific. So today we have a special session with our invited guest, Professor Ian Loader from Oxford. Thanks to all of you uh, for attending. Uh, Ian is professor of criminology and a pro professorial fellow uh, of All Souls College. He is a fellow of the British Academy and Royal Society for Arts and a member of the advisory board for the Chief Review of Policing in England and Wales and the Research Advisory Board of Canada, Nova Scotia, Mass Causality Commission. Professor Loder is one of the foremost political theorists of policing, of policing, not just in Britain, but internationally. He's published six books, as well as a host of theoretical and empirical papers on policing, private security, public sensibilities toward crime, penal policy and culture, the politics of crime control, and public rules of criminology. Professor Loder is currently working with others on a three-year study entitled Place, Crime, and Insecurity in Everyday Life, a Contemporary Study of an English Town. He is also working on a monograph with the working title of Ideologies in Crime Control to be published by Oxford Unity Press. The book forms part of a long-term project and has pursued with Richard Sparks termed A Better Politics of Crime. We will start the session with a presentation by Professor Loder. This will be followed by some questions by the moderator, myself and Jeff Fagan, who's a professor at Columbia Law School. And then using the chat box, we'll open up the questions to the audience. So thank you, Professor, uh, for visiting us today. Uh, the floor, so to speak, is yours. Um, thank you very much, um, Christopher, for that introduction, and um, um, and thank you um, to Jeff and you for the invite. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to um, to be. I really just want to make some um, remarks um, to get the conversation started, um, and that's going to involve me um, just saying a few words about the kind of current context of. Um, um, I was going to say British policing, um, but I think more accurately, I'll be talking about English and Welsh policing, given that Scotland has its own separate police force, as does um, Northern Ireland. Of course, the Northern Ireland police force arose out of a, a very different and unique history in that, in that place. So I want to say a few words about the, 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 the kind of current context and the ch changing context in which English policing um, now takes place. Um, and then say something about what I take to be the promise of what I've called here minimalism. Um, as a way of grasping the contribution that I think policing best makes to questions of, of public safety. Um, as some of you may have seen, I circulated a background paper in advance, which was a thing I wrote for the Strategic Review of Policing in England and Wales, which is actually just reported. Though I'm gonna kind of talk around that rather than directly um, to that paper. I'm also not gonna make any explicitly comparative remarks um, in my own introduction. I'm happy to take up the kind of comparative questions in discussion, because I understand that's what many of you um, will be interested in. Um, I'm going to I'm going to start um, in Macclesfield, um, which is a town of about fifty thousand people in the north of England. For those of you who know England at all, it's about twenty miles south of Manchester. Um, I've been with my colleagues um, spending a lot of time here recently because we are revisiting an old study, which is the one that you see on the screen in front of you. Um, and, um, and trying to ask again um, a series of questions about safety and security. And in particular, we're interested in the question of what it mean, what it, what it means and feels like to be secure um, at this moment in time for the inhabitants of that place and how questions of, of crime and harm and threat and insecurity, um, both experienced by different people in the town um, and what kinds of demands for safety and security does it, um, does that, does that experience generate from, from the police and other kinds of security um, operators? Um, one of the issues that's, um, that's kind of come up in, in our discussions and observations this time, which we, I reckon our recollection had no parallel when we were there in the mid 1990s, um, is the issue of um, what you might call conflict at school drop off. Um, 
So this is a whole bunch of questions to do with children's safety when children are being dropped off um, in cars and with other parents in cars. Um, a whole bunch of questions to do with illegal parking and with to do with sometimes actual conflict between um, residents and parents, um, in where, which are often narrow streets that weren't um, originally designed for um, cars. And this is um, it's getting rather a lot of attention, this particular issue, various schools in the town. Um, and it's actually started to receive um, lots of police attention. So what you what you have on the screen um, in front of you um, is a, an extract, a field note extract from um, from a recent ride along I did with a police officer in the in the town. Um, I was planning to read it to you if I can actually hold on. If I move your faces out of the way, I'll, I'll just read it out. It's probably easier to. Um, so we, are, we go off to patrol outside the local school. Being here has two purposes, to be seen and to get to know people. Lots of the children, one or two parents say hello. But the PC told me he was mainly here to regulate parking drop off issues. It's chaos when I'm not here, he remarked. He explained the problem, the dangerous junction and parents parking on the pavement, blocking residences and dropping off in the no stopping zone. The road is narrow and on a corner. He kept a watching brief and explained to me what his rules were. Pavement parking is okay if a double buggy is can get past. No parking ways that are dangerous or obstructive and no dropping off in the no stop zone. One driver did just this. He pulled up in an Audi SUV and stopped to let his boy out. The PC explained that he couldn't stop here. The male driver barely spoke but had anger and irritation etched all over his face as if he couldn't somehow believe that he was being reprimanded for such everyday behavior. Um, now, the reason I've started here, um, well, there's several reasons I've started here. Um, one is this strikes me as a kind of quaint and English example, and I thought that might be the kind of thing that you liked. Um, more seriously, um, it illustrates a couple of points that I want to return to later in the discussion. Um, firstly, um, the kind of felt, and in my view, slightly overrated importance of, of the police being visible and present and reassuring, as he puts it, being seen um, in local social relations. And secondly, the rather more significant importance, as I'm going to say, of the police's role in managing conflict on the surface of social life. Now, I say on the surface because I think the other thing that this example reveals is the important sense of the limitations that the police have when trying to complete, uh, when trying to contribute to public safety. Just think a bit about what's going on in the example I've just described. Um, the first and interesting thing is that the police officer in this case is actually trying to regulate behavior, um, which is at best borderline, borderline illegal, in some cases actually lawful, an example of what Robert Agnew has recently called ordinary harms. This is a local social problem, which in many ways is the legacy of, um, of urban infrastructural design, urban infrastructural design that in many cases preceded um, the car. It raises a whole series of, of questions to do with the role of the school um, in the safety of its children as they get to and from school and as providers of that um, safety. It's a product in all kinds of ways of changing patterns of everyday life. Very few children in Macclesfield walk to school. Um, I discovered this week that only 1% of children in the town cycle to school. And of course, it's a product of the way in which modern life has become dependent on the car um, and the system, wider system of automobility with which that dependence is wrapped up. So there is, in short, it seems to me, very little the police can do um, to generate public safe security in these settings, other than doing what the officer is in fact doing, which is managing so conflict at the um, surface. The wider lesson I draw from this little example is this, that if we want to think more seriously about public safety, we need to focus a lot less on the police. But given the material and symbolic pr presence that the police have in social life, both in, in the society I inhabit and indeed in yours, and the centrality and seeming obviousness of the association between policing and crime and safety, this is, um, this is in many ways a difficult thing to do. And there are all kinds of reasons why we are we required to think about both the ways in which the police have come to assume that material in symbolic presence and to try and identify in the midst of all that, what we think is the significant contribution that they might make to public security. Now I'll return to that in a minute. 
But with this in mind, I want first to make a few remarks. Um, and this may, I'm help, hoping, um, help our comparative discussion about the changing context and contours of, of English policing. The first thing to mention is, um, it's, it's the kind of what you might describe as the changing landscapes of crime and victimization or the changing landscape of crime. This has, this has a number of dimensions to it, which I might just identify what I take to me the most significant. The first of these um, is the drop in levels of volume crime, um, burglary, car theft, car crime, minor assaults and so on. So since, since 1995, when we were there in Macclesfield doing the, the, the first of, the, of these studies, um, since that time, levels of volume crime in England and Wales have dropped by about 75%. They've largely been, this has been the, the other side of this picture, has been the significant rise in internet fraud and other kinds of cyber related crime. So in 2021 crime survey, 53% of reported victimization um, happened through, um, through our computer schemes, a minimum, a minuscule amount of which 0.1% ended up in charges being pressed against anyone. This, is a, this has created a kind of significant issue, which is testing both the resources and the capabilities of the police to deal with, and indeed raises questions about whether the police are the agency who can and should be dealing with this. Um, there's been increasing, um, increasing amounts of reporting of rape and sexual assault, uncertain whether this is about changing reporting levels or about um, changing patterns of victimization. And I think a general drop in the kind of salience of crime as a kind of public issue. So Ipsos Mori um, here has been conducting a kind of uh, what he calls a kind of national issues kind of survey on a monthly basis for years and years now. Back in 1994, when we started the first study, crime was regularly in the top three of what people thought would be the top, um, the nation, national, the top national um, public or problems. Um, um, as of the end of last year, it wasn't even in the top 10. So that's the, the, the first aspect of the landscape. The second aspect of this landscape, and it's not entirely unrelated, though it doesn't entirely simply just flow from that changing landscape, is the altered priorities of the police. Um, speaking in broad terms, I think, I think that picture now looks something like this, that the police have, have to a large extent, or at least spend much less of their time governing public space and overseeing or trying to protect public property and have shifted their attention and resources towards high crime victimization that takes place in private space. Notably, this includes, includes notable among this is domestic abuse, but it also includes um, sexual exploitation, people being victimized by, um, by modern slavery, an increasing amount of preoccupation with um, missing persons, especially missing children, um, attention to what, what Macclesfield Police now call persons of concern, who are principally being reported because family members or others have some kind of worries about their, their vulnerability. Um, so a kind of a quite dramatic, I think, shift from being an agency for the regulation of public space um, to one concerned with high harm um, in, um, in private space. Um, save, the, save for the important and exception to which I'll also come back to, which in many respects that the police, when it comes to the regulation of private space, have become a frontline agency for the management of mental health and mental health um, disorders, as, as um, I understand is also the case um, in the States. This has all gone along with, and I'm not suggesting there's any cause here, with plummeting detection rates. So the last time I looked, um, detection rates for recorded crime were down for, to, to 9%. The third thing to mention here is, I think, um, um, is best described by the oxymoronic phrase, a permanent sense of crisis. Um, by definition, a crisis can't be permanent. Um, but it seems to me that in the kind of 30 years that I've been studying British policing, um, that it really does have that sense that it has lurched from, from one crisis or one scandal um, to another, um, principally orga often organised around questions of, of, of race, but not exclusively. Um, over the last 12 months, um, actually, most of those conflicts and scandals have, a, have arisen in relation to 
the capacity or incapacity of the police to deal adequately with questions of sexual violence. Um, so the, the, the picture on the, the screen in front of you, coming from probably Britain's leading conservative newspaper, is actually, um, the, uh, it's a picture of the police protest of uh, a demonstration um, that took place um, in response to the murder of several Everard by a serving police officer called Wayne Cousins, who actually um, kid kidnapped and then murdered Sarah Everard, having effectively arrested her using it, or purported to arrest her by showing her his um, warrant card, claiming that she was in breach of COVID um, regulations. This generated a huge uproar. There was then a kind of what many people thought was an, at the very least oversensitive policing of the demonstration um, against uh, uh, both, uh, both in response to this incident and towards the general feeling of inadequacy in how the police um, uh, deal with sexual um, violence. There's been on the back of this a whole series of further revelations about um, toxic sexist cultures in various police stations, usually, um, usually located in um, London, um, as well as other kinds of um, recent scandals about um, failed investigations, institutional cover-ups, which have recently led to the resignation of the Metropolitan Police Commissioner having lost the confidence of London's um, mayor. Um, which brings me to my final point. Um, th th there is some evidence that, that, that these recent scandals are, um, are having some impact on um, recorded levels of public confidence. Um, that's true of some, some, um, some work done in, in relation to, um, to women's confidence and the, the police's capacity to protect them from sexual violence. Um, it's true in relation to levels of victim satisfaction more generally. Um, it's especially true of minority groups. And there is some kind of been slow dropping off of general levels of public confidence, which are regularly measured here. Um, but they remain high. Um, uh, the, in the, the, the last survey I looked at, 55% of the British population still think the police do an excellent job. Um, and this is reinforced a view I've long held, which is that one of the most interesting, I still think not adequately answered questions in the sociology of policing is why in the face of three or four decades of recurring um, failure, misconduct and scandal, levels of public confidence in the police remain as high as they do. Um, why is it the case, and I still think this is the case, that there is a large degree of effective identification um, with significant sways the British population in both the police as an institution and the idea of policing. Um, there is a close and seemingly obvious or common sense association between the police and order. Um, there is a demand for some kind of ambient presence of the police in local social relations and the police remain a kind of materially and symbolically central agency when we think about more broadly about questions of public safety. <clears throat> now it's against that backdrop that I want to just conclude um, by, by kind of articulating, I think, I think a rather different conception of policing, um, which I think is kind of, has uh, um, also long been buried in the kind of debate and, and the conception of policing in, in England without, without ever kind of coming to the fore. Um, and I want to say a bit about, it, about that, that vision. It's a vision that I've here called minimal policing and what I think is ingredients um, to be. Um, I think the starting point of, of, of this conception of minimal policing is that it decenters the police from the central role it occupies in public debates about um, safety. And in that sense, um, has a large degree of, of um, affinity um, with various of the claims of the defund the police movement, both in the uh, originating in the US, but um, uh, uh, many ways of, of, of spread um, throughout the world. But at the same time, it seeks to, seeks to identify the minimum necessary contribution that the police can make to public security. And that contribution I see as, 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 a, as really in being a re as a reactive rights regarding agency of last resort intervention in social life and necessary investigation of um, criminal harm. And I want to say a few words about what I take to be the three um, three limbs of that conception, uh, um, which handily all begin with R. Um, so the first of these is um, is response. Um, by res by response, what I mean is I, I think of policing as an institution 
that should principally be in the business of reacting to rather than directly seeking to prevent criminal harm. In other words, police authority and agency and power should be mobilized or mobilized or triggered by the occurrence of harm, not in a bid to go around um, preventing it. And that's not because I don't think prevention is important. I'll come, I'll come back to that. And there seems to me both a positive and negative limb um, to, to this conception of policing. The positive element of, of this is, is that the police, the, the, well, to, put it, to put it bluntly, the, the police should come when people call them. And that coming when, coming when people summon police attention without fear or favor and treating people with voice and dignity along the lines that one finds um, voluminously in the procedural justice literature, the importance of that to people's sense of security um, should never be underestimated. It seems to me to matter enormously that when people are being victimized or have suffered harm, they can basically call the, call the state and summon help and the state comes. Um, there are large parts of, of the world where that's only partially true. There are large parts of the world where it's not true at all. And I think we underestimate our peril, the centrality of, the, of doing that basic reacting policing um, well. The flip side of that, as well, the, the negative element of response is a kind of, a kind of warning or hesitation about proactive policing. In other words, it's a kind of warning about a conception of policing where police officers are in the business of going looking for things, um, stop and frisk or stop and search, if you call it here, would be the obvious example, or find themselves in the business of kind of heading upstream and seeking to identify and tackle the causes of the things that they might find themselves dealing with on a daily basis. Which brings me to repair. Um, Egon Bittner, in probably what this probably I think still stands as the single most famous sentence in the sociology of policing, um, once wrote that the police are called in situations where, as I quote, something is happening which ought not to be happening about which someone ought to do something um, now. Bittner's point was that the police are called in these situations because they present what he says is a unique capacity um, to, if necessary, um, impose a provisional solution on whatever difficult situation to which they have been called. Um, of course, it doesn't necessarily require mean um, that we need an institution called the police to do that work. But I think Bittner's point is there are situations in so social life um, where some institution or other um, needs to possess the capacity, if necessary, to coercively impose provisional um, solutions. So one point, one part of Bittner's point, and I, th I think this is the point in which in the end, having spent a lot of my time a couple of years back thinking hard about this, in which I depart from certain abolitionist versions of the defund the police movement, Bittner's point is that sometimes coercion in social life is just unavoidable, and we need to recognise that and think about ways of capping it. I think his other point, or at least my interpretation of his point, is that we need to recognise that the police are symptoms managers, that the job of policing is effectively the brokering of provisional solutions to problems, the causes of which and the solutions to which lie often well beyond their control. Now, I like, I assume many of you in the room speak to many officers who find that experience extremely frustrating. Um, part of that frustration is the constant feeling that you're, re you're managing the same people or the same groups of people for the same kinds of things. Um, but I think despite that frustration, there's an important reason, but for, bothly to resist the idea that the police's job is to go upstream and try and um, address these things at cause recognize that there is a great public value in doing that kind of symptoms management well. In other words, the, an agency that can provide fair and just provisional solutions to situations of conflict and harm and trouble um, provides an important ingredient of people's sense of secure belonging. Which brings me finally to the idea of referring. Um, referring really means that recognizing that the core of the police role really does lie in repair and that the having done that necessary repair work 
the police's job is really to pass things on. Now, of course, in the, in the realities of the world in which we live in, in my case, a kind of a system of a welfare state, which has been starved of resources for the last decade, I guess in the state, in the, in the case of the US, a welfare state, which has always been patchy and un, uneven, um, that does raise a significant question um, about who exactly are um, situations of trouble that the police, um, as it were, place uh, some band-aid over actually to be referred to. And we can talk up that, talk about that in discussion. But it seems to me that the important point here is it's not so much that one, important though that is, but about the resisting the idea that it's the job of the police institution to somehow go upstream, to become problem solvers, to engage themselves in trying to find solutions to the problems of which they are managers of the symptoms. Because I think that when the police do that, they colonize the work and resources that are best left to other agencies, whether that be mental health providers, educational providers, housing providers, social workers, and so on and so forth. And I think that's a, a point that has been very well made um, in the context of the, de the debate about defunding um, the police. Finally, and I'll finish. Um, what, what this conception of minimal policing, I think, is underpinned by um, is a particular kind of conception of how we should theorize the relationship between policing and security um, in a democracy. The dominant understanding, what I take to be the dominant understanding of this idea, really treats the police, in a, a, the, its best case version of the police, as an answer to the question, how safe am I? And it's and the way it kind of cashes that out is in a conception of policing, which I've described with Neil Walker elsewhere, as shallow and wide. In other words, it requires more and more police actively engaged on the surface of social life in trying to provide um, uh, reassurance for citizens. I actually think the relationship to policing and the relationship to, to policing and security is best described as deep rather than shallow. And what, by which I mean that the police are not simply an answer to the question, how safe am I? The police are always at the same time an answer to the questions, where do I belong and who cares about me? Now, it seems to me that the police can provide both, often do provide negative answers to those questions, especially for minority and other marginalized groups, but can in principle provide affirmative answers to that question. And that is best done, not through uh, some kind of ambient conception of policing operating actively and busily on the surface of social life, but through that notion of minimal policing that I've just described. One that is reactive, rights regarding, and an agency of last resort, intervention and investigation. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Jeff, you're gonna start? Ian, thank you. That's wonderful. And again, we're deeply appreciative of you being here with us today and uh, with this large gathering of people, like this electronic gathering of people. Um, let me start with a, a question about um, where the locus of control is in the design and governance of policing. Um, your vision raises some here to there questions. How do we get from where we are today to, to the, the point where you want to get to? Um, that's essentially, to, to, I think in our terms, a, a regulatory question that is um, dominated by certain interest groups that have power and influence over the way the government resolves those questions. Um, I would guess, you know, you note in some other writing that the politics of identity and recognition around race, uh, gender, sexuality, and so on are really important things that uh, influence the way that debates about policing unfold. But also um, for other people, um, the social welfareist ideas about policing and how those should be constructed. And that can be a double-edged sword, but let's just keep it in that one bucket. So here, I mean, there's a, there's a very deep conversation about the politics of policing in particular about wh whether and how there should be some forms of democratic control and regulation of policing. We really don't have it. We see many people search for it. And there are movements that seek to make it happen, but it's really kind of an uphill struggle at the moment. Um, and it speaks to ideology. Um, I, you know, and, and I think you're, you're very forthcoming and open about it, ideology, not only in, the, in this piece, but also in various other pieces that you've written. 
So, um, and it leads to, leads to a kind of a strained conversation. So I'm just wondering how these debates unfold in the UK about democratic control, uh, participatory control, some, something other than the kind of institutional control that dominates the way that American policing debates are resolved. Or uh, not just institutional debates, but, but um, I think in another paper, you talk about sort of the, the delegation of governance to different interest groups. And uh, so the delegation to, so for example, um, in the evidence-based policing movement to people who were doing kind of experimental research. So I'm just wondering how these debates about um, uh, democratic control and essentially underneath that, the design of policing unfold in the UK and any thoughts you might have about our context of, um, here in the US. Okay. The, the, um... There's a, there's a, there's a, right. But let me, I'll just, let me just tell you about the, the, the three things I have in my mind. Um, so that one, um, what, what, one, one thing, and I think at the time it felt like a very significant thing, um, but I'm, I'm not sure it's actually ended up like that, um, was the introduction a decade ago of what are uh, 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 called elective police and crime commissioners. Um, so every police force in, 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 in England now, now ha has an elected crime commissioner. Um, and it's in a, in a British context, it's a unique constitutional office because it, it, no, nowhere else across the, the realm of public policy um, do, do we elect anyone just to run a single public service. And that's effectively what police and crime commissioners um, do. Um, and at the time they were introduced, um, I, I sometimes felt like the, 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 the only person who wasn't a paid up member of the Conservative Party who thought this was a half decent idea, um, or at least not, not, a, not, a, not a completely bonkers idea. Um, but, but many of the skeptics at the time um, worried that this was a kind of politicizing of the great traditions of impartial British policing. It was a, and it was a no, and this, was, this is never meant as a compliment. It was an Americanization of, of, of British policing. Um, not helped by the fact that many of the people advising um, the Cameron government at the time had come from the states to, to promote this idea. Um, um, but uh, so there was a there was a big worry about this. Um, it's not, it's not been a great success, but it's been a bit of a squib. So uh, so for the most part, with the single exception of the of the 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 largely untrammeled power of police and crime commissioners to hire and fire chief constables, which they have and have sometimes used quite um, liberally. With the exception of that power, um, the, 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 the kind of governance landscape has not really changed. Yeah, people have turned out every four years to kind of vote for them, that, but, that, but PCCs are not very prominent public figures. Um, um, and much of the kind of governance landscape looks, I think looks very similar. So, there's the, 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 so we've ended up with a very sort of tame and slightly tedious and um, unengaged version of what, what, are the, what are the time I think some of, including me, hoped will be a, a mechanism for injecting um, uh, a certain amount of kind of democratic life into how we how we kind of think about policing. So that, um, no, we, we, that's, that's, that's one thing. Um, the, the second thing is that the, I think the general governance, so the general governance landscape in England and Wales, it's very crowded. And there's a large amount of kind of delegated or mediated institutions that are concerned with different aspects of, of policing. So you've got the, the, the PCCs on the one hand, you've got the Home Office, who to some extent had taken a step back in order to kind of localize democratic role of policing, but in recent years has kind of stepped back in and providing much more strategic oversight. Um, but then there's the kind of independent um, policing spectrate, um, which over the last decade has become a much more important institution under its, um, he just actually retired, but he was a he was the first inspector who was um, who wasn't an ex police officer, um, and really took it upon it himself to kind of shake up police institutions. Um, then there's the independent office of police conduct, which is a kind of external complaints body. Then there's a the college of policing, which is a kind of a kind of professional standards body um, that tries to model itself on kind of professional standards bodies in medicine. And then, Jeff, as you mentioned, there's a kind of evidence-based policing movement, which has kind of you know, got some kind of footholds into, into how policing is done. So, so on the one hand, you've got a kind of body that purports to offer a kind of version of democratic control. But actually, I think a lot of the kind of action in police governance is actually takes place in, in kind of in 
in kind of mediated bureaucracies and other kinds of delegated um, institutions. Um, the, the final thing I'll say is just this. Um, I think partly because, um, I'm a risk to set, this is going to risk, sound too glib, but, but the, the, the English are very attached to the idea of local policing. <laughs> they think that, that, that so much so that they kind of, that sometimes they kind of think that's what policing is. So, uh, so a large amount of kind of imagination and will has gone into the, to the idea of thinking what it means to make the police accountable locally. Um, um, but it's increasingly dawning on people, not, not least because of what I was saying about the shift to kind of online crime and you know, the ways in which all sorts of you know, large amounts of serious harm are, you know, think about sex trafficking or you know, county lines, drug dealing, is just organized on a cross force basis. Um, that almost no one in the professional police community here anymore thinks that 41 separate forces is a fantastic idea. There's all kinds of inertia that leaves them in place. Um, and increasingly people are having to think about you know, larger um, regional and national or maybe even kind of international police units. And there may be all sorts of kind of compelling operational reasons why that makes sense. But I just don't, so I, I don't think we've ever had a very developed conversation about what that means in governance terms, in regulation terms, because we're just not very used to the idea that policing institutions can be large and national um, in this context. Um, I'll probably better stop there. We, we could have a conversation about what that might, how that might translate into your context, but um, we can maybe come back to that. Uh, Chris has a number of I questions. Think, well, well, I'm going to... Um extend your last point and also bring in a question from uh, Lloyd McDonald. Uh, so Lloyd writes, on a broad basis, what do you see as the material similarities or differences between the state of policing in the US and England and Wales? There has been a significant drop in crime here, but I don't believe anywhere near the 75% level you cited. Um, I guess added to that, in terms of your comments about reactive policing, um, of course, rates of violence, rates of homicide in the U.S. are enormously higher than they are in England. And I, I wonder if your model of a truly reactive policing uh, fits well in American context where, um, as you say, the job of police should be repair. Well, if somebody's dead, uh, repair is, uh, can be a little difficult. Um, something about things, things like gang violence. Um, so see me the broader issue of differences and then sort of do those differences really make a, a difference in terms of how we should think about policing in the US. Does the minimalist model kind of fit the US uh, situation as well as it might the British one? Okay, this isn't gonna, this I've been I've been I've been trying to to answer this question in my head all day because I thought someone would ask it, <laughs> which is not, not gonna not gonna make my answer seem any more adequate. And I think it's a hard question to answer because because so, um, uh, because some of the ways of answering this question are just so large and so structural as to seem kind of unhelpful in any kind of policy discussion. So, so I could, and I'm about to say that, that there are, there are, no, there are clear differences in the, no, the capacity of the British and American states to pacify its population to control levels of private violence. Um, there's, there's a significant development in the no, development of kind of welfare state institutions that can in effect do some of the work that, that many in the kind of, no, on the, in the defund the police movement of, of I think quite accurately said have kind of fallen to the police um, for reasons that we might want to go into. Um, and there's clearly a big difference in the kind of um, uh, a whole series of significant differences um, uh, that flow from the availability of guns, both the availability of private guns and the availability of the state to routinely carry and, and, um, and use guns. And, and as well as in the sheer size and diversity of American police forces, which you know, range from the M NYPD um, to, a, to, to no, a couple of guys who've had very little training um, out, out in no, rural Cam Kansas somewhere. Um, and so all those differences, no, we, I, I don't quite want to do with that other than say you need to take those in, things into account. But then again, there might be situations where the, 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 
that recurring problems do come up, um, uh, which just look, have a certain, a certain degree of kind of family resemblances in both places. So, so, so the example that's come to my mind as I've been thinking about this today is the, is the, reg, is the kind of management of mental health. And I, so my, my understanding is, you no, know, in, the, in the US, in the same way this has been true here, that the kind of the management of mental health um, has become a kind of task of frontline policing. And in all kinds of ways, it's super problematic. It's problematic in the US case because, because it can, because those events can end lethally because of the of, of ability of guns. But it's problematic in any event. There seems a kind of inappropriateness to it. And, and I've witnessed a couple of these events um, um, in my field work in recent weeks that the, the, the kind of police turn up and it kind of just, because they're the police, it kind of changes the dynamic of a situation. <laughs> It changes the dynamic of a situation for the purpose of person on the receiving end of the of the policing, who at some level just thinks that they're having a bad time, they're feeling crap, they're you no, know, they're about to behave in strange ways, and the police turn up and as someone said to me when I witnessed one, oh, I'm going to get arrested now because no, um, um, so that so that the, the meaning of a mental health episode changes when the police turn up, and of course the risk of of the police intervention. Even when, and even in a UK case when the guns aren't involved, is that in a sense police have a kind of trained, a trained capacity to think about life through the lenses of order and control, not through the lenses of you know, managing other kinds of mental health episodes. And I, th I think that's, I mean, maybe we could just throw this back into discussion, but I think the question of how, how you de-police the management of mental health um in situations where and th of course this is why the police sometimes end up back in these situations where sometimes situational coercion is just required sometimes it's required for the benefit of everyone involved in the situation um and the police are the agency that we kind of that we've evolved to to deal with those kinds of you no know, that, that kind of situational coercion um and of course there's a whole bunch of things tried to do with you no know, you know, joint police and mental health teams and so on and so forth. But um, maybe I'll just stop there because that, that, because that does seem to me a, a site or an issue or a public policy issue in which it is probably possible to have a more fruitful comparative conversation than me sitting here saying it would be a great idea if you could just re re reduce the level of kind of gun ownership, <laughs> um, which may be true, but isn't super helpful. Um, yeah, I guess I would just say in response, um... I think there's a lot of support in this country for the idea that the police should get out of the mental health business, including by police, certainly ones I talk to. I think this is a terrific idea. It will make it quite clear that they don't think they have the training. Um, they will also say, and who's going to show up at 2 a.m. in the morning? Are you going to get social workers <laughs> to come out at 2 a.m.? Um, Often it's just the police are the only thing that's available. Um, but I, I want to summarize a long comment that you certainly can read in the chat from Saul Glick, where he, he's referring to a, a related issue uh, in the UK. Um, he's talking about children and how there are 650,000 referrals of children to social workers each year. Uh, 420,000 are children at risk. And there are 31 uh, uh, thousand social workers, uh, and only about half of them take on frontline responsibilities. And the UK police actually refer more children to social services than the other agency. Uh, so, and we see this problem in the US too, which is, I mean, I'm not sure you have an answer, which is just to say um, the issue here may not be a question of. Uh, persuading police that they should get out of the mental health business as much as building a, a social welfare structure that actually um, could adequately deal with the problems that the police have been uh, had dumped on them. Now that I mean at this this point I, I don't I don't I don't have a kind of easy answer to Saul's question. Um, but I mean your your observation about police officers in the states is my observation about police officers here they have no great they have no great desire 
um, to be a frontline mental health agency. They have no great desire to do many of the things that they end up doing. Um, and as they'll, they'll, to some extreme, they'll quite rightly tell you they're doing them because they're the 24 seven service. They don't, they don't clock off at five um, when other agencies um, do. And because sometimes, so the, the, sometimes um, situational, as I've just said, situational coercion is, is, um, is mm -hmm. um, required. So there, there's a, there, there, there's a kind of interesting conversation to be had about how we, how we kind of think about the relationship between police authority and the various kinds of institutions of social welfare and how they should react and how we think about well, well they're funded and so on and so forth, to, to which, to which I have no easy answer other than to say in any, in any kind of ideal conception of how I think we should, we should design policing and think about how it best contributes to kind of public safety and harm reduction. I wouldn't have it doing a lot of these tasks. Um, and the, and the, 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 the resolution to that conundrum probably doesn't lie in the police itself. It relies, opinion, it relies on the, 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 uh, what's on? I can't find the right word now. It relies upon having a kind of conversation and forms of, 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 of kind of funding and growth for the agencies that the police, I think, sometimes rightly feel they are standing, they are standing in for. Jeff, you have another question? Um, I, well, I had a, I, let me, let me pose a question and then go to, uh, David Sklansky's question, which is uh, an interesting one about reform. It kind of overlaps with one of my questions too. Um, a short question. Uh, we have a lot of surveillance in the US and you have a lot of surveillance in the UK. Um, and there's some worries about surveillance and uh, particularly, for example, just simply about error rates of people who are included on gang rosters and things like that. And um, uh, the error rates inherent in facial recognition and so on. The technology is sort of out ahead, I think, of what a reasonable regulatory response might, might suggest. Um, but on your proposal for minimalism, how do you incorporate the urge, which is really seems to be irresistible among police to, to engage in, in that kind of surveillance uh, with a minimalist approach to policing? One seems maximalist in a sense, not so much in the context and in the, in the idea that people have contact with the police based on that. Although that does happen, I think here, but how, how this is sort of cabined in terms of its reach uh, and how it's really controlled. I mean, this is one of the delegation questions that I think came up in mm -hmm. some of your work. Yeah, I'd have to think a bit harder about this. I mean, I mean, I mean my instant response is that no, is, is the one is in the same place that, that as you've just described it, that there, that there seems a kind of tension between some conception of minimalist policing and the pervasiveness of surveillance, which, which just looks, looks like, looks maximalist as, and, you know, and sometimes is generated by the kind of proactive seeking out of uh, and retaining of information. But it's also, uh, it's also a question for police who increasingly now have things kind of it's become increasingly possible for just for people to kind of pass some things. No, um, uh, no videos, photos of, of, of kind of behave, you know, bad behavior they think they've seen. Um, so the, the amount of uh, the amount of information that is now possible for the police to proactively gather and reactively just receive is. Um, uh, it's just increased massively. Um, yeah. So I don't have any kind of smart ideas for how you regulate that. I mean, maybe there's a kind of protection in the mass that there's just so much of it that the police really don't have the resources or wherewithal, wherewithal to, to actually know, to know what to do with it for good or for ill. Um, um, but at the moment, I don't really have a better answer than that, I'm afraid. I mean, in a sense, it's de there's a delegation to, uh, uh, to, to the, the data scientists who come up with algorithms about how to manage it. Uh, let me turn to, to David's question, because David's question, I think, goes in part to the, to the minimalist, maximalist question. Um, and I think it's something that, that I've thought a lot about um, in my, my research. Um, he says, one of the debates in the U.S. about reform versus defund has to do whether, in general, we should be trying to minimize contacts between the police and the public. 
Um, and I think we recognize that much of the, the, the unfortunate outcomes of those incidents comes from a maximalist approach to contact. Um, has that been part of the debates, the recent debates in the UK, and is minimizing contacts along the lines of your proposal of that minimalism um, between the police and the public part of your vision of minimal, minimal policing? In other words, shrinking the footprint and the interactions. I, I think so, subject to this proviso, and I've never quite managed to figure out exactly why I think about this. So I, so I, so I think the kind of Democrat in me, um, um, and, and, and I suppose this underlined, this was one of the reasons why I thought there was a version of police and crime commissioners which would, 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 would make the police a much more kind of, you know, responsive institution. Um, that kind of what, that kind of wants to cultivate a kind of critical engagement with the with the police. You know, it wants to kind of what wants to create a citizenry that are kind of you no know, alive to the issues that we spend our time professionally discussing, that kind of thinks about them, that kind of you no know, has their say, you no, know, and, and so um and and kind of you no know, becomes so it becomes a police version of a kind of active and engaged citizenry. So that there's there's a part of me that is persuaded <laughs> that that's that that would that will be a good thing and, and policing will be better for being subject to that kind of the, the ongoing critical engagement. Um, um, the flip side of this, um, and what's the best way of putting this? Um, I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a large section of the population who just never think about the police from one day to the next. I think that's true here. I think that's true in the states. So I mean, it's, it's the point that the it's the point the Black Lives Matter activists make about white American suburbs. They don't, they effectively have no police. They have the police when they need them, but most of the time they never see or think about a police officer. Um, so there's a bit of me that thinks actually um, that so on some version of a better or good society would be one in which most of us just never had to think about or meet a police officer from one day to the next. Um, um, and maybe that's that that that's the that's that's the thing that we ought to aspire to to creating. Obviously, if, if people need you know, need because there's that they are suffering from harm or victimization, that's a different story. But to create the conditions in which people don't need to think about or engage with the police, that that doesn't seem to me such a bad outcome to want to strive for. Now, in all kinds of ways, that's not. Um, and this goes back to what I was saying about the kind of the kind of. Um, the kind of affection that that large swathes of English society have for for certain conceptions of local policing, um, for r rightly or wrongly, that that much of the kind of reform agenda shared across large parts of the political spectrum here is about trying to find ways in which the police can engage more with the communities. Um, no, so you can you can meet an officer, they hold surgeries, you know their names. Um, um, uh, and that seems to be to be a kind of no, it often gets presented as a kind of progressive way to go. Um, and there's a version of that you can kind of sign up to because you want the police to be kind of engaged and and uh, and responsive and all those kind of things. Um, but I still remain at the end of the day a bit unconvinced about that. I'm still so that so I think you're right. No, if, if you press me, I think my version of minimalism is a is is to go back to David's question. Um, is a is a version where most people just don't meet or think about a police officer for as much as as much as as much as they possibly can. Yeah. Um, Ladon Reynolds has a question um, that's um, also interesting. A little bit um, back on the mental health theme, he says, "My U.S. agency is exploring an alternative response to mental health calls for police." We currently have a model that involves a simultaneous response from mental health professional and police. However, many mental health professionals that I have spoken to are leery of response that does not involve police as, as first responders. Um, I think if I understand the Don's question, this is this is to get to this is uh, there's some inherent danger in mental health calls, and, and to have it be a, a really segregated uh, between police and mental health workers is uh, not realistic. Um, it's also not part of what the demand is. And so just, any thoughts about that? Yeah, no, I see, I see the problem. Um, yeah, so, so what I think, so, right. So there, there, there's two different, I think different, 
two kinds of worries that mental health professionals might have about, for example, the kind of team working with police in responding to a kind of mental health instance. One, one is that they get, um, uh, one is they kind of, kind of get implicated in a kind of order maintenance um, management frame because because they've because they've um, uh, because they've partnered with the police. The other is is um, is that maybe some of the kind of situational kind of coercion kind of falls um, falls to them. So it doesn't strike me that that though it has certain kinds of attractions in opening up the police and mental health teams to each other's perspective on situations, there are certain kinds of risks. So there, there may be something to, to return to, to, to my brief articulation of minimal policing. There may be something to be said, if you can get it right, in the mental health field for a version of repair and refer. That actually, if there is, you no, know, if there are, in situations where part of what's triggered the intervention is some perception of disorder or risk that the, the, the situational control falls to the police, but very, very quickly you want that, you want that situation, you want that situation handed over to professionals. I know, I know you get that I mean, in an English context. I mean, uh, if you think about kind of temporary sectioning under section 136, the Mental Health Act, I mean, police departments will tell you sometimes that places of safety are meant not to be police stations. They can be, but they're meant not to be. Um, and there's designated places that, that police can take people. But police officers will tell you that often um, mental health professionals don't want to take people and, uh, under certain, um, if they're intoxicated, drunk, um, a risk to themselves and, and, and others. So there is a kind of, there is a kind of inherent, seemingly inherent difficulty in trying to stop this being a police matter and, and to locate it in the place where you think it will properly to be located. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting that there's a shared space of the, the uh, for this, the ubiquity of the danger imperative between the mental health workers and the police. It's a very interesting overlap. I hadn't really thought about that myself either. Um, uh, well, people should, people should read the, the chats because there are a lot of people who have responded to this and appropriately pointed out that in many cities have already done this. Uh, last year, we had the head of CAHOOTS, which is a program that's been going on in Eugene, Oregon for more than 25 years uh, here to talk about how they deal with mental health issues. Um, in my memory is that it was only in a very small percentage of cases that they actually find that they needed um, to partner with the police, I think for something less than 10%. Um, People are, and then many of you, Alex, uh, others, Brian has talked about stars, um, have indicated, you know, these efforts in other cities. So I think, you know, the claim that this isn't possible, at least from the perspective of, can you find the social workers is, uh, we've got pretty strong evidence, empirical evidence that that's just not the case. The social workers are out there. You know, I have to pay them more. Um, I think, you know, the, the issue is you know, probably much more where um, where does the, the funding come from? I wanted to ask a different question that you partly answered with your mental illness model, but, um, you know, if we think about the U.S., and I suspect this is true uh, in Britain as well, um, different demographic groups of innocent people uh, face really different policing burdens. Um, among the innocents, if you're a young male, uh, a member of a marginal community, uh, particularly living in high crime areas, you're kind of far more likely to be stopped and possibly arrested and in most unjust cases incarcerated. As a political theorist, um, in addition to your mentalist model, which does seem like, how do you think we, we should think about this in equity? Because it is, it's actually a huge one that at least in the US, I think it's received far too little attention. Sorry, so the question is how do we, how, how do we, how would we, sorry, I'm not, I'm not um, I mean, here's this inequity. It's, going to, it's kind of hard to just make it go away. Minimalist policing would help. Um, you see policies of, I don't know. I'm asking for the, partly for the institutional design part of the 
your political theories and orientation. <clears throat> See if you have any thoughts. I mean, that, 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 I mean that, that's why, I mean, that, so, so to come back to my answer to David's question, um, I mean, the, 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 bit of, the, the, the bit of me that wants to kind of cultivate democratic engagement rather than you know, kind of, you know, um, uh, the kind of, the, the, the not, not able to, 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 to think about policing. Um, in a sense, it flows out of the experience of the person, that you, the notional person that you just described. Um, so if you think about, uh, as, as Otwin Marilyn once said, if you think about, no, pl policing in structurally divided societies, it, and this is, true of, this is true of yours, it's true of mine, it, it kind of does two things. It simultaneously um, provides the conditions of general order from which everyone could benefit, irrespective of where they are in a hierarchy. And it provides the conditions for maintaining a, a, a special order in which certain kinds of interest groups benefit and others um, don't. So there's a kind of there's always a distribution of burden and benefit going on. And the, you know, to put it crudely, the more unequal society, the more that the more that um, the inequality and in the distribution of those benefits and burdens. So the person you just described is at the butt end of the distribution of those of those um, uh, burdens. Um, so experiences, and you know, as Vesla Weaver and her colleagues have pointed out, no, often for many people in those communities, police is their, their experience is their experience of of government. It's how it's how they learn about things like citizenship, um, and 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 they they learn all kinds of what we th are damaging lessons about what it what it means to be that kind of citizen um, in this um, in this society. So that's that's and that's where I think questions of democratic design kind of matter because one thing you might want to try and cultivate in that situation is the capacity for people who find themselves in that kind of relationship to the state to have institutions for the meaningful exercise of voice i mean there's a separate series of questions about whether they are they the forms of kind of pathological socialization they've been through mean they're not wanting to exercise that voice but to create conditions where their experience of the state can find meaningful um exercise and it's in relation to that problem where i just think you need to thicken forms of democratic monitoring and control and the because the option of just the option of for that person saying well no just don't think about the police from one day to the next that's not an option that, that seems open to them shall we say um, um and, and, and absent of creating the conditions in which they can live their life like that the best it seems to me you can do at the moment is is create create circumstances in which that that the voice of people in that that, that that marginal position can get themselves heard in institutions that matter, and that kind of takes you back to Jeff's point about the kind of arguments that have taken place about about forms of community or neighbourhood control of police departments, I guess. Yeah, in Boston we have an organisation called Teen Empowerment that does exactly that. I went to uh, one event of theirs, which was. Interesting and almost hilarious. Uh, there were three or four dozen police officers were attending, and the young teens put on a whole skit about how they've been treated by police. <laughs> and uh, I hope it was informative for the police. There certainly were many of them sitting there squirming in their seats. <laughs> Maybe we should. Uh, change uh, the conversation a bit. Ir Irving Waller asks, can you talk a bit about the role of National Prevention Agency proposed in the strategic review of policing? Um, yeah, I'm now doing this from memory because the, the whole thing came and went a couple of weeks ago. Um, I, 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 um, right, firstly, the disclaimer, um, which I was, I was a member of the, the advisory board um, of this the, of the of the strategic review um, the advisory board was a diverse bunch um, so we had some very interesting conversations um, but we didn't get to write the final report so um, uh, so that so um, that's kind of worth noting um, what what so so from, from a position of a kind of insider outsider it strikes me um, that the most interesting and innovative thing that report um, proposed was 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 a version of what I what I said in my remarks an attempt to try and decenter the police 
from the conversation about what it means to prevent and reduce harm and to find ways of kind of institutionally locating that question uh, um, somewhere else. Um, now, as it happens, my, wo my worry about the report is because, because so much of it then becomes about the police. Um, the, and because um, policing systems have all sorts of, you know, there are they're existing institutions with entrenched interests, people that care about them, that the, that, that, that aspect of the report hasn't got obvious institutional kind of force behind it, that it might just fall away. Um, and that, so that's a worry, but I, th but I think it's important. So the, I think that the, there were two limbs, to the, two limbs to this suggestion. One was to create this kind of um, um, national kind of crime prevention commission who had some kind of strategic oversight um, uh, over questions of prevention. So, so you, in a sense, you give prevention some kind of um, institutional clout in society that is separate from um, policing and thinks about the kinds of things you might want to do um, uh, in, in policing, uh, in prevention that, that, aren't, um, that aren't about the police. And I think much of the thinking for that actually was a way of registering the kind of, um, just the sheer amount of victimization that now takes place um, in online forums. Um, and I, I never quite know what to do with this thought. I mean, I mean, it's worth bearing in mind. I mean, modern police institutions as we know them, are a product of 19th century industrialization and the kind of coming together of, of classes in in uh, in large cities. So they were they were they were they were, I mean, this is a there's a longer version of this story, but they were created to try and manage urban conflict. Um, um, if if you take the view that we're living through a, 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 an in, a digital revolution, which is likely to be of 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 um, of comparable proportions in the effect it has on the ways in which we all live our lives, um, it seems likely that that will generate um, uh, a kind of uh, a transformation in the way we think about questions of, of prevention and order and control and the kind of institutionals, institutions we have for, for handling that. So, so one argument for the kind of National Crime Prevention Commission was really, really came out of the kind of move of criminal victimization online. Because one thing that has just become very apparent is that so much of that, that harm just never, e either never finds its way to police attention at all, or they are institutions which, which lack the capabilities and the resources and the kind of wherewithal to be able to effectively um, respond to them or prevent them. So that was one strand of thinking. The other limb of this proposal was to create a legal was a recommendation to create a legal duty on private companies to prevent um, crime. In other words, to prevent crime, which is a product of, which in a sense flows from their um, activities. Um, and there's a, um, there's, uh, there's, all kinds of, uh, there's all kinds of ways you might wanna go with that. Um, but it seems to me that in terms, of, in terms of a kind of serious conversation about how you build prevention into kind of everyday activities, that, that was by far the most innovative thing that the commission uh, came up with. We'll see what happens to it. Um, I think we've got a minute or two if people want to raise their hands and ask a question. Um, if not, I think there's a, Juan has asked a, a good question for us to conclude. As people will see in the chat, um, lots of people have lots of things to say. I don't have very many questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's in the nature of a conversation, I think. Right. right. They must all be lost. Uh, so what we so, so I, Juan early on asked uh, in the chat, um, so what should the police be doing in uh, terms of the school drop-off problem? Uh, your original example. Yeah, that's... Well, I guess to I, I guess um, I'm hesitating because I don't really know. Um, so one the, one thing they could doing so between that between the officers and uh, between the, the police and the civil enforcement officers, or what we used to call parking wardens, um, um, th th they exercise a kind of thin kind of 
enforcement presence over the whole scene and they move around local schools they try uh, and uh, so sometimes they're there and sometimes they have an effect on the ways in which behavior happens and sometimes they don't um um but beyond that i don't know what the police can do because it seems to me that, that that for all the reasons that i tried to kind of articulate this is a problem which in all sorts is, is deep rooted in the ways in which we live and the ways in which we design cities um I mean, maybe as we face up to the kind of, no, the realities of, of climate change and the short window in which we've got to do something about it, that actually this small local problem actually starts to look very different and can be transfigured very differently. So there are, there are, there are other schools in England and there's a kind of government program along these lines where the school actually gets the power to close the streets around it during drop off and pick up time. Um, so effectively you design the traffic away from the scene. I mean, you may, take the view just move the traffic somewhere else um or you encourage schools to um um <clears throat> or you encourage schools to become much more actively involved in trying to encourage active travel as it's now called in 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 this country um but as for the police role in this i mean it, there, there's one point that may be worth making i mean it may be that what and, and this 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 can also go to the um this can also go to the kind of other issues where where the kind of critic of the police says that police have kind of colonized functions that properly fall to other institutions. Um, uh, and you can take the view that the no, officers, the, the police have, have kind of welcomed this because it grows their budgets and their influence and their footprint and so on and so forth. But if you take the view that they haven't, that some of this has been reluctantly fallen upon them. I mean, one thing you might imagine the police doing is being kind of brokers who can pressure other agencies who may have levers that the police don't themselves have to do something about it. Um, so in the small example that I've just given you, um, the officer, the officer that I was observing, was pretty irritated at what he talked to be what he took to be the kind of um, uh, the um, what's what I'm looking for um, reluctance of the school to think that how children get safely to and from it every day is anything to do with them. Um, so you you can imagine a version of his role where actually his job is to um persuade the school to think about this question rather differently and to act accordingly so you so there might be so one answer is that it might be a kind of brokering role um yeah i mean you could reasonably take the view that really that why why should the police have that role but because precisely because they are in the middle of managing the symptoms of this problem maybe they are better able to kind of to 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 conduct that role and it may be that no one if they don't no one else will I don't alex, know. alex Vitaly asked a question that was, was on my mind. Why, why, why are the police involved at all in resolving a traffic problem? Should, shouldn't that be delegated to the transportation authorities or the traffic managers um, to redesign the drop-off and pick-up zones? And school officials also have a very strong say in that. And, and in many instances, they actually do that stuff. So, so I'm just curious about what the argument is for police involvement at all in, in a problem such as that? Is it a demand question? Do people think that, do they, that, you know, you make the point about the demand function and understanding demand for mm. policing services. Um, is, it, is there a demand for that? And, and if so, how do we sort of educate people to think about making the demands outside of the policing world and into essentially the institutions that are most effective by it? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, 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 yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I don't, I, I'm not going to take much persuading that there really, this is nothing to do with the police at all. And I should just, I should just, I should just clear off the scene. Um, um, and that, that really any, any attempt to think systematically about how you manage the various kinds of issues that are involved in this kind of little local scene, um, don't, don't, don't in the end involve the, don't in the end involve the police. So, so, so the answer to the question is why in the absence of that they are there, I think is several fold. One of which is, is that sometimes they, they are responding to, to, I mean, people have written to them saying, no, it's chaos. It's chaos here in the mornings. Um, um, the parents are behaving badly, blah, 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 come, come and sort it out. So, that, um, so there's a kind of, so that it looks like that this is a kind of order management issue right. of a, of a, in the way that kind of, no, patrolling a kind of, town centre on a Friday night when people are drinking is a kind of order management issue. Um, 
Or there's a version of this which says, well, no, my job is to be kind of visible and just you know, offer reassurance. Um, and that's so if I'm going to be visible and offer reassurance, I'll go and do it in places where one people are gathering. They're taking their kids to school. So are we are we seen I'm maximizing my visibility. And there is something for me to do while I'm there, which is to assist in the regulation of bad parking. Um, I guess that's the better. So Brian has indicated we actually have a whole event next week on getting the police out of traffic enforcement. So okay, I might go. I may you, to you that. To <laughs> um, Malcolm Sparrow, I, I understand you have a question. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, Ian. Um, uh, I, I have a couple quick points. One, one is um, in all the discussions about um, other responders than police for incidents that might involve mental health, I, I've not heard a practical solution to the sort of inevitability of first response triage. Um, there's not that many calls that when they come in, you know it's a felony call. Or there's not that many calls that you know when they come in that mental health issues are involved. Uh, perfectly typical example elderly woman living alone calls and says uh, there's a man in my backyard and I'm terrified and you don't know then uh, whether it's a, a burglar about to break in you don't know whether it's a homeless person looking for a place to sleep you don't know whether it's um, Alfred who lives down the alleyway um, who's out again at night looking for his cat um, which by the way a neighborhood police officer would know but your model doesn't include neighborhood police officers I imagine um, and uh, uh, half of government showing up um, initially to decide whose case this is uh, for all these course, uh, calls that remain thoroughly ambiguous at the outset just seems implausible. Um, and then if there are mental health issues, the police response is first safety, but second uh, referral. And that's pretty much the uh, role now in most places. Um, if they're not good at it, I understand that's a problem. Um, and I think they have to get better at it, um, for sure. Um, but I don't think that um, we're going to escape the inevitability of a first response triage that is going to be uh, the police. Uh, and this second point, listening to your um, minimal, minimalist prescription, what do you say to somebody that says this sounds like a throwback um, to uh, 20 years, to the professional era of police, which relied on notions of principal distance, uh, the antidote to <laughs> um, corrupt intimacy, um, and did enormous damage because um, no one knew the police and uh, in increased alienation and separation. And by the way, didn't enable police either to understand or to resolve local problems because they were going incident by incident, case by case, um, and often late intervention after harm was done where there might have been an opportunity for preventive action had they um, had a you know, broad aware, awareness of the um, situation. So, so some might say this sounds to me like the undoing of everything that we had learned about problem-oriented policing and the undoing of everything that we had begun to learn about effective community-based policing. Um, it, you, I think you have to be, have to be able to answer that um, sort of reaction uh, in order for this to look like a healthy proposal uh, for anyone that has followed the various eras of police uh, strategy. Okay, um, right. The, maybe there's a bit in their answer to both your questions. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm. I, I'm sympathetic to, to, to what you had to say in relation to the kind of first response, that really there's a, there's a kind of ambiguity, there's a kind of information deficit. Um, right. And the only way you can resolve any of that or even begin the process of resolving any of that is by showing up. Sure. Um, and you're showing up in situations when, when someone, is, someone is troubled and concerned and, or troubled enough, concerned enough to have, to, have called, to have summoned authority to deal with this. Um, and, and, and of course, the reason I mobilised Bittner again because his point was that well, that's 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 the core of the police function. That's why that that's why people call the police rather than anywhere else because that they in that since they've got a capacity to situationally resolve the ambiguity in a way that make things go away. So maybe that if you're right about that, and I'm persuaded that you might be that actually some some ver if you were trying to design better systems, 
some version of repair and refer in which refer happens quite quickly if referral is what's required is is about the best that one could hope to design and that's it for the, for those for those um situations am i undoing 20 years of of, of wisdom and good practice um i don't think so so that what so the so the um See, I have nothing against uh, kind of problem solving, um, kind of early intervention, prevention, preventing things happening before they get before they get um, before they get um, serious. Um, I, I think our society should invest much more money in doing that kind of thing rather than managing symptoms of things when they happen. The thing I've always been less persuaded by is that that's a police job. Um, and so, so, bit, so the reason I mentioned Bittner in this, so, so what legitimates police intervention, no, what makes police unique as a social institution, what legitimates their intervention in social life, if we are going to have it, is that they have this unique capacity that no one else has. Basically, that, that, that when, 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 when things go wrong, they've just got the capacity to mobilise force to impose a provisional solution. Um, so my worry about... Um, is that about all the kind of things you just described is it just sends policing into areas of social life where it's not obvious that that's any longer what they're doing and if that's not what they're doing i think that actually the burden of legitimation falls on people who think that they want police officers you no know, in schools solving problems with social workers doing all these other kind of things when uh, in the context in which we as a society have limited resources to spend on this kind of stuff um so, so I, I don't, it may not be my view that the police should never be involved in this, but they should probably be invited in by people, by organisations and agencies and agents to whom I think this work um, properly falls, um, rather than it, be, it becoming kind of um, uh, a constitutive part of some kind of expanded police, police role. I guess I would want to respond to that the point that Pat Sharkey of Princeton's been making, which is the police are unique in another way. They're really the only organization that has the capacity to deal with gun violence. Direct gun violence. Of course, that's much more an issue here in the US than it is in Britain. I don't think there's sending social workers into <laughs> the two gangs that are about to. <laughs> Well, presumably they, they, they have that they have that capacity for the for for the reasons that the for versions yeah. of the reason that Bittner says that they that, that they alone have the capacity to um, to respond in kind, for better or worse. Well, I think we're uh, out of time. Uh, this has been a wonderful conversation. Uh, thank you, Ian, and thank everyone else. Um, much to think about here. Um, Certainly, you've given us a, a phrase to think about a whole lot of ideas, which is this notion of minimalist policing and uh, what that implies and how, how we uh, go about uh, actually implementing it. Um, but I, th I think that's an extraordinarily uh, productive uh, suggestion for, for thought uh, if, and possibly for action. So uh, everybody's going to clap, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, well, I may clap too because um, it's been very stimulating. So thank you all to everyone. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great.